Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Kingdom Voice Broadcast. I'm Apostle Lance Bellany, and as always, it is my pleasure, extreme pleasure, to have you with us here on the broadcast, because without you, uh, we would simply be preaching to the uh, internet sphere. But you make it certainly personal, and you make it all worthwhile by being here with us as we share with you truths of the kingdom, from an apostolic perspective. And we challenge you here on the broadcast to think about the things that you believe. And that is a part of our journey into the kingdom. That is a part of our kingdom DNA. And here on the broadcast, we want to make certain or we want to challenge our journey to make sure we're journeying uh, and taking that next step in our journey. So. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of the broadcast and uh, uh, allow me, if you will, just to uh, dispense with a few formalities as we um, as we begin the broadcast today. Um, I want to ask that those of you that are watching, if you will, to please like, share and subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel uh, or share uh, the broadcast from our YouTube channel or from Facebook. We are multi. Um, uh, streaming the uh, simulcasting, excuse me, the broadcast over Facebook Live as well as uh, YouTube uh, channel, our YouTube channel. So please like, share, and subscribe uh, if you haven't already done so. Um, also, um, we welcome your questions and your comments. Please, um, um, if you uh, do so on Facebook, we'll get them. Uh, here uh, in our studio, or if you do so on YouTube, likewise, we'll get them in the studio and uh, we want to uh, engage with you in that manner. So please uh, uh, give your comments. Even if you disagree with something, I say, give me an opportunity to address that uh, with you. Or if you agree with what we said and just have a question about it, uh, please pose your question and we will address that uh, as a part of the broadcast. So thank you again so very much for being here with us on the broadcast on today. Um, if you'd like to reach us, if you'd like to connect with us, you can see on the screen, you can do so uh, via email at lcbellany at yahoo.com, or you can do so via regular mail at Kingdom Voice Broadcast, 214 Remington Road, Huntsville, Texas, 77340. And uh, we would definitely appreciate you uh, connecting with us. And we invite you to visit our website. Uh, there on our website, you're going to find more information about us, about the ministry. You're also going to find our blog and as well as um, uh, our podcast. <clears throat> you're going to find uh, access to that. And uh, it's more information um, that you can have access to if you'd like to share with others or uh, just uh, consume more information about what Holy Spirit is giving us to say and to deliver to the kingdom heirs uh, in this season. Feel free to reach us at www.rotruth.org, rotruth.org. And for those of you that consume podcasts, you can, uh, you can find our podcast. We simply uh, make a podcast of every broadcast that we do here. Um, and if it's something that you would like to listen to in your commute back and forth to work, uh, or perhaps on a journey that, that you're taking with your family, you can uh, listen to the podcast uh, at anywhere you consume your podcast, um, either uh, Anchor or uh, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Wherever you consume your podcast, you can find uh, a copy of our podcast, of our latest broadcast um, that we've completed. Lastly, as we get ready to go on, uh, those of you that would like to make a, uh, a contribution, a donation to the ministry, you can do so via electronic means at Cash App or at PayPal. You can see the information on the screen uh, in the bottom, uh, or should I say on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. So thank you so very much and uh, allowing me to uh, address these uh, few formalities here on the broadcast this morning. Okay. So we've been talking about we've been talking about the origins of uh, Christianity and the origins of what we believe. And I was in a very interesting conversation. I won't go into the conversation today, but 
uh, we will uh, go into that conversation um, uh, at some point in time, uh, perhaps maybe in the next week or so. But it was a, an extremely interesting conversation. As you all know, I've been addressing a lot of the influence that Catholicism has had on um, uh, what we believe in Christianity, okay? And the origins of Christianity in Catholicism. And you know, I've been addressing that. Well, I had the pleasure of sitting down with a young man that happens to teach Catholic theology. Now notice I said and used the term Catholic theology. First of all, it was a very, very congenial conversation. I was extremely pleased with the fact that we could have a conversation around something such as this and it be a mutual exchange of information. <clears throat> we challenged uh, each other in terms of the things that, uh, that he believed and taught and, and what I believe and experienced, as a matter of fact. He was a much younger man than I am, but uh, but it was very interesting. And and one of the things that really came to light, uh, of which I was you know had some sense of suspicion that it was this way, was the the the, the true depth of belief that um, uh, of Catholicism that unless you are Catholic, then you are not in good standing with God. It was very interesting. And again, I'll go into the particulars and the specifics at another time, but it was interesting because of the fact that I have been challenging the origins of Christianity back to the influences of, of Catholicism uh, to sit down and be able to have that conversation and really see some of the things that I have been advocating and challenging really be, uh, a, 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 in fact, a matter of fact, uh, in terms of where this young man was, was bringing forth and, uh, and sharing concerning uh, his faith, he's a Catholic, devout Catholic, and his belief in what the Catholic Church teaches. So it was very interesting, and it was a very um, uh, meaningful conversation that I had with him, and um, I will absolutely be uh, sharing uh, a lot more of that conversation in the days to come. So having said that, um, uh, it is, it is, it was needless to say, very interesting. So today, what we want to talk about, and again, following that same path, we want to talk about the influences of Hellenistic culture on the origins of what we now call Christianity, the influence of of Hellenistic culture. Now, for those of you that don't know what Hellenism is, and I didn't know what Hellenism was when I first encountered the term, I had just heard that term um, and, you know, kind of brushed it off because it really didn't matter to what I was doing today. Well, not so much. Hellenism is uh, the culture, the Greek culture, the name rather for the Greek culture and the influence that the Greek culture had on the broader Mediterranean region during the time that the Greeks were in charge and began to conquer the neighboring nations, okay? And so the influence that Greek culture had is known as Hellenism, all right? And Hellenism is, again, or rather the Greeks had this philosophy or this approach to conquering. They didn't want to destroy you. They really didn't want to destroy the people and the, and the countries that they conquered. They wanted to um, incorporate those countries and those peoples into Greek life. And in, and in, in fact, that is exactly what they did. And that phenomenon is what we now today referred to as Hellenism and the influence of Greek culture on the cultures they conquered. And it was, it was no different, or should I say no different, um, um, Judaism and Jerusalem did not escape this either. Uh, they were heavily influenced by the Greeks which set up a very interesting dynamic. When we read in the scriptures 
the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what you're seeing is a an influence of Hellenism or the Greek lifestyle and the Greek culture upon Judaism. So the Pharisees were the conservative, strict, Levitical priesthood uh, faction of Judaism. The Sadducees were the aristocrats, the elites, the educated, and they were more in tune with adopting and embracing the influence of Hellenism upon the, the, the practice of Judaism. And what you ended up with was instead of the Levitical priesthood being in charge or you know, the, the dominant influence, you, you had the competing faction of the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin council. So you went from the Sanhedrin, or, or should I say, you went from God-ordained Levitical priesthood to man-established Sanhedrin council. And that's where uh, the, the, the Hellenistic influence began to happen and take place and to, to, to impact Judaism. Um, then you have our Lord coming and uh, being placed in that arena. Okay. Now, mind you, it was during this time that Rome uh, had now conquered the influence of Greek culture, still very prevalent in the region at that time. And now our Lord comes and establishes the kingdom. In the midst of all of that, in the midst of all that I just shared with you, now our Lord comes sent by God, sent by our Father to establish the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is neither influenced by the Levitical, I say influence, that's the wrong word of God. It is not beholden to the Levitical priesthood, neither was it beholden to the Sanhedrin council, the Pharisees nor the Sadducees, okay? It was to be and established rather by Holy Spirit, by our Father in heaven, and the catalyst of the kingdom in the earth was our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. And the entire effort and the entire goal of the establishment of the kingdom was to establish the intimate relationship between the individual and the Godhead. Okay. Now, given the significance of the influence of Hellenism, okay, and the influence of Judaism, people fighting to establish a dominant place, the intimacy aspect of all of that got lost. And now what we're doing is you have the conservative uh, Pharisees trying to hold on to the Levitical law, and then now you have the uh, liberal and more secular bent or oriented Sadducees trying to appease and incorporate into the Hellenistic culture. And both of them vying and, and, and pulling at the reins of power of religion. What got lost in all of that is, hey, this movement of the kingdom has nothing to do with either of them. We want to establish the intimacy between God and the individual. Forget about all of these other hierarchical, ecclesiastical, leadership-based uh, movements or expressions. We want to establish the individual. And to this very day, and part of the reason for this broadcast is that the individual dominance has never been achieved and never been established. It has never been established as a part, as the main practice of 
what we now today know as Christianity. And this, I believe, is why God is establishing or is uh, um, re-energizing and refocusing on the kingdom identity. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Me and my father are one. You have no need that another man teach you, for all shall know me. These are all subtle nuances of the intimacy that God was desirous to establish, even as far back as uh, Moses and the exodus out of Egypt. Gather the people and I will speak to them. This is what God said. Gather the people at the foot of the mountain, have them sanctify themselves, cleanse themselves, and I will come down and I will speak to them. But what happened? They heard the voice of God and they became afraid and then told Moses, you go talk to God and then come back and tell us and we'll do whatever you tell us God said to do. This is the priestly hierarchical, you go, uh, 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 the surrogate nature of the relationships that we have even to this very day were established. The seeds were set and sown at, at, the, at Mount Sinai when God came down to speak to the people and they got afraid. And so today what we have more than anything is that we have this same type of engagement with God. But I digress. Uh, we're talking about the Hellenistic culture and the impact of the Hellenistic culture on, um, on what we call Christendom today. I want to read something to you real quick. <clears throat> and uh, just indulge me here as I share some information with you. Hellenism is the term used to describe the influence of Greek culture on the peoples of the Greek and the Roman empires conquered or interacted with. Upon the Jews return from exile in Babylon, they endeavored to protect their national identity by following the law closely. This led to the rise of the hyper-conservative Pharisees and their added uh, and they added unnecessary laws. So the Pharisees being hyper-conservative, they not only adopted the, uh, the, the uh, original laws, but they even added more laws. And let me say, let me take a minute and, and just engage this right quick. If you will remember the council at Jerusalem, this is when Peter, the brothers came to Antioch and they decided that they were going to make the Gentiles if you will, be circumcised to become Jews, to convert to Judaism before they could uh, embrace the kingdom. Paul, objecting to this, brought the disagreement uh, uh, back to Jerusalem to have the apostolic leaders of that day rule and give counsel on that issue. And they did. And out of that issue and out of that council, there were only about three mandates that the uh, apostolic council made on the Gentiles. Abstain from fornication, abstain from I food offered to idols, and, it, and abstain from blood and things strangled. Four things, in, and it's written in the book of Acts, four things that came, at least that are recorded to have come out of that council. And for the sake of argument as to whether or not the council ever took place, let's just allow those four things to be um, to, 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 to stand for a second. Four things that were mandated upon the Gentiles. I want to repeat them. No fornication, no food offered to idols, no uh, food strangled and uh, uh, blood sacrifice. OK, stay abstain from 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 those things. Look at what has happened to Christianity when the beginning of any kind of apostolic mandate began with those four things. This is how outside in relationship with God ultimately ends. Somebody, someone begins to add their own flavor to what God said to you, and then somebody on top of that, and on top of that, and next thing you know, you have this bloated monstrosity 
this uh, uh, again as as apostle vince likes to say uh this mongrel of a relationship of a set of rules and regulations and practices that get set up and you end up with what we have today where you can't wear clothes and you can't wear makeup and you can't go to the movies, you can't play sports and you can't drink wine and you, it just gets to be so, all of this hodgepodge mongrel of a, of a, a set of regulations and practices that are unsustainable. And that's where we are, unfortunately, today. But anyway, the Pharisees added unnecessary laws, laws that God didn't establish. About 100 years after the Jews returned, Alexander the Great swept across Western Asia, extending his territory from his native Greece down into Egypt and east to the borders of India. The influence of the Greek culture contained, uh, past, uh, contained past the first century BC, uh, uh, continued, excuse me, past the first century BC, past 100 years. That's how long the, 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 the Greek culture maintained its, its dominance amongst the people. OK, when the Roman Empire took control of Israel, the Pharisees rival sect, the Sadducees welcomed the Greek influence. Remember, I told you the Sadducees were the liberal side. They welcomed the Greek culture. Now, remember, now the Greek culture brought all manner of gods, all manner of 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 uh, cultural behavior that were foreign to the uh, Hebrew culture that had been established amongst the Hebrew people, among which were Jews and out of which came Judaism, okay? Now in comes all of these, multi, this multiplicity of gods, this multiplicity of philosophical beliefs, this multiplicity of cultural behaviors came and began to influence the, uh, the Hebrew culture. And the, the Sadducees were all too quick to embrace that. <clears throat> The Sadducees were wealthy, powerful Jewish aristocrats and elites who openly worked with the Gentile rulers to maintain peace and ensure a measure of political clout. This wasn't just about peace. This was about clout. This was about power. This was about being uh, in control. OK. Um, let me see. Uh, all Jews were influenced by Greek culture, however. The Greek language was well known as the native Aramaic, uh, as well known as uh, Aramaic was known. The Jewish leadership changed from the God ordained priesthood to the Sadducee controlled Sanhedrin. So let's, let's stop right there for a second. We're talking about the influence of Hellenism on. Uh, Christianity and Jewish life at the time. I want to read that again. The Greek language was a well was well known was as well known as the native Aramaic language. The Jewish leadership changed from the God ordained priesthood to the Sadducee controlled Sanhedrin. How? Why? Because the clout of money influence and power ultimately won out, or at least in public display, it won out. One thing I want you to understand, no matter how, no matter what influence, power, wealth, and, and, and money tends to, uh, seems to have, God always maintains a remnant of his people that will stand for what God is saying rather than where culture is going. God always maintains a remnant. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever feel like you're the last one. You're the only one. God always has a remnant of people that will keep truth moving forward. Hellenism also expressed itself in minor ways, such as Saul, such as Saul taking the name Paul. That was an influence of Hellenism from Saul to Paul. Hellenism had a great influence during the early years of Christianity. I'm going to read that again. 
Hellenism had a great influence during the early years of Christianity. Sometimes the influence was felt indirectly, meaning that the influence of Hellenism brought cultural advances, which are probably good, roads, bridges, engineering, technology. Hellenism brought that into uh, My apologies, everyone. I, I do apologize. We were having technical difficulties uh, once again, but we were we were reading the impact of Hellenism on Christian culture. So let me start here. Hellenism had a great influence during the early years of Christianity. Sometimes that influence was felt indirectly by way of, say, roads or uh, cultural advancements, technology, things of that nature, and sometimes directly uh, upon the, uh, theological synergy, synergism, okay? Here, uh, um, Hellenism impacted the early formation of Christianity in ways that now have taken on a life uh, or, or, or an existence that are contrary to the establishment and the furtherance of the kingdom. So first of all, we have to understand that kingdom and Christianity, as I've said on many occasions, are completely inconsistent with each other. And let me give you the, 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 the most significant reason why Christianity and the kingdom are inconsistent. The most significant reason why these two expressions are inconsistent with each other is intimacy. Christianity will not allow you to be intimate with God. The, the very existence of orthodoxy in Christianity is directly is in direct conflict with intimacy in the kingdom. Here's what I mean by that. Orthodoxy demands that you do it a certain way. And if you listen to this broadcast for any time, you've heard me say that before. Orthodoxy demands that you do it a certain way. Now, let me be very uh, generous in saying this. Orthodoxy says that I have to do it this way. Now, this way, whatever this way is for the moment, may have been a legitimate way. But the minute you begin to mandate this way upon everybody, upon someone else, is when this way begins to be at odds with what God wants to do. Because God may not want to take that individual the way that God took the person who wrote the way. If, if I could, if, 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 I hope you understand what I'm saying. Thus making orthodoxy something that is in conflict with what God wants to do in the individual. 
This is why Christianity, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islamism, anything that establishes a way begins to be at odds with intimacy. And in our particular case, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. And for most of us that are coming to the kingdom, that are probably associated with this broadcast at the moment, are probably coming out of Christianity, okay? There will be those that come out of Hinduism, out of Buddhism, out of uh, Islamism, and, and, um, and every other. There will be those that are coming from every place, if you will, that will begin to, um, that will begin to experience the pull of orthodoxy from wherever they came from and begin to try to reconcile their orthodoxy with the kingdom. There is no reconciliation. You have to abandon the orthodoxy and begin to establish the intimacy with God. And the only way that can happen or will happen is by a greater relationship with the Godhead through our mother, through Holy Spirit. And then you can begin to have a high level, a level, uh, a greater intimacy with God than you've ever had or with the Godhead than you've ever had before. OK, so by way of a few areas uh, that that began to influence Christianity, how many of us have ever heard the term Gnosticism? So, so Gnosticism is a uh, was deemed a heresy uh, as a part of orth uh, as opposed to orthodoxy. Gnosticism was was a, a heretical uh, a belief system that um, that early Christians fought against because they disagreed with what Gnosticism offered. Okay. Here we go again. They disagree with what Gnosticism offered. And if you ever begin to hear the term Gnostics or Gnosticism, you'll begin to understand that that was an absolute enemy, arch enemy, number one to, to early Christianity. The quote unquote church fathers wrote about Gnostics and Gnosticism and uh, ad nauseum in their, in their early writings. They wrote about it to the I mean, that was that was the devil incarnate Gnosticism was. Well, let's read a little bit about how and where Gnosticism comes from. One of the most dangerous influence of Greek thought on Christianity. There you go. Uh, the calling it dangerous, being very judgmental about what Gnosticism was. But certainly it was dangerous from the perspective of the Christian, the dominant Christian belief at the time that this uh, began to 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 uh, rise to significance. One of the most dangerous influences of Greek thought on Christianity concerned Greek beliefs about the physical and spiritual realms. Greek philosophy taught that the earth was created not by the most high God, but by an underling several levels below who imbued the physical nature of his creation with imperfection. The physical was seen as evil. Only the spirit was good. These beliefs manifested in several ways. If the physical is evil, then Jesus cannot be fully man and fully God. He either only appears to be physical or he cannot be the son of God. Similarly, if the physical is evil, there is no resurrection from the dead. Instead, salvation is reuniting the spirit with the high God. So that's where that, that that's the root of Gnosticism. And you can see that Gnostics, if you will, the core of Gnosticism took their belief to the state and to the point where if you were believed in a physical Jesus, then you have missed the mark. Jesus could not be physical because physical is evil, because this physical world was created by an evil God. It gets it gets into a particular belief. The kingdom and, and I want to bring it back to the kingdom. The kingdom believes that we are created by God, by the most uh, high God, the creator of all things. OK, that this world, the kingdom is established on the premise that God, the creator, the most high God, we call him Yahweh, or at least the Hebrews called him Yahweh, OK, which was the name that they established 
as a part of their worship of the most high God. The kingdom is predicated upon that God. And a relationship with that God comes on the premise of the spirit of that God engaging with the person of that was born into this world. Hence, the born again experience. The kingdom is based upon the born again experience, meaning that the person born into this world is not is born again. And the spirit now is no longer just of this world, but is now from above. The born again experience. This is why you cannot be converted into the kingdom. You must be born into the kingdom because conversion, and I'm going to split hairs here, conversion represents a change of mind. I convert it from one belief to another. I can do that internal. The born again experience is not predicated upon me. It is predicated upon Holy Spirit engaging with me and I embrace what Holy Spirit is doing. I can reject what Holy Spirit is doing, but I embrace what Holy Spirit is doing. And thus the born again experience takes place. And now I am born from above. And that person that yield that's yielded is not of this world, but it's from above. This is the aspect of the kingdom life that we must begin to embrace. But I digress. We were talking about the impact of Hellenism on, on uh, the, the, the Christian uh, life and the Christian lifestyle. Uh, Gnosticism played a significant role. The, the church fathers fought that. And I believe both the Gnostics and the early church fathers missed it completely. Because in their effort to combat, combat Gnosticism, they began to establish all kinds of other uh, uh, orthodoxy that had nothing to do with the kingdom either. Remember, the kingdom was what we were trying to, or what was being established in the earth and what the, the quote unquote early church fathers and the Gnostics were trying to do was well, they were trying to redefine religion in the eyes of the people trying to give religious context to a kingdom experience. And this is what I am efforting to try to help you understand today as a part of the, 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 the role of kingdom voice broadcast. You're not trying to conform to a religious belief. You're trying to establish a kingdom intimacy. That intimacy that you're trying to establish is unique between you and God. There is no hierarchical orthodoxy that you must be beholden to. That kingdom experience that I am advocating uh, uh, that you participate in is unique between you and God. It is unique between you and Holy Spirit. It, 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 uh, it embraces you as a part of the Godhead. Listen, let me say this and I, and I, and I will move on. I want you to recognize something in, in, in this transformation. When we begin to embrace the kingdom, we must begin to understand that Yeshua was a man born of a woman. Now, let me say this, and I'm going to digress for just a moment before you, in order to allow me to, to move forward. One of the challenges that, that is out there is, is the translation of Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 64, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I may be off on the, the exact passage and chapter, but, but it is Isaiah that talked about and a virgin, at least that is what is written in the King James, a virgin shall be with child. There is reasonable and powerful question and debate as to whether or not that translation was accurate. And I have to say, after investigating the translation of that passage of scripture, that it raises a significant question in me as to whether or not the translation was accurate. And this is what I mean. 
the KJV translates it as a virgin shall be with child. The, the challenge asserts that the translation should have been a young lady shall be with child. There is a huge difference between a virgin and a young lady. Okay. The challenge and the argument has been made and, and, and levied against uh, uh, the modern uh, translation of the KJV or the latest uh, official translation of the KJB that the translators use the wrong word, giving thus a significantly different uh, perception of Mary's birth of our Lord. And I invite you to look up the virgin birth controversy. That's, that's how theology phrases it, the virgin birth controversy, okay? But let's take and let's play the advocate for the non-virgin birth side for just a second. It doesn't change my perspective of Messiah at all. On the contrary, it lends itself to more of a kingdom identity. And I know that messes with a lot of theology out there. It messed with my theology, but suffice it to say, I engage you and encourage you to explore that issue for your learning and for your edification. But needless to say, let me, let me go on and say that even if he wasn't born of a virgin, he most certainly would have been born again, which identifies me more with him than if he was born of a virgin. It gives complete identity to the idea that he was the prototypical son of God upon which all the rest of us are patterned. This is why it's imperative for us to begin to establish a kingdom identity as we move forward, as we engage this life. We have to begin to see it from a kingdom place and not from a religious place. I, I digress. One of the, um, the other influences, and you heard me mention this earlier, of, of uh, Hellenism on Judaism and ultimately Christianity was this idea of uh, the rejection of monotheism. The Christian Judeo beliefs, and I'm going to read this to you, the Christian Judeo beliefs in one God was completely foreign to the Greeks. The Greeks, the, the Greeks had gods of everything. Okay? And for this culture, now that they are trying to um, acclimate into their culture, has this hard line, staunch, unwavering belief in a single God, period. End of discussion, no room for debate. They were fairly accepting of other religions, however, wishing not to destroy nations like the Assyrians did, but incorporate them. The Jewish and later Christian insistence on keeping their religion pure amused and sometimes angered the Greeks. In essence, the Greeks said, what? That's silly that you want to not let your religion incorporate other things, because according to Greek culture, it was okay for your religion to be uh, uh, fluid, okay? It wasn't about orthodoxy with them, a right way to do it. It was just the fact that you did something in the name of your God. So if I wanted to adopt a different God, I could do that as long as I did it in the name of that God, okay? And so uh, the, the Greeks saw the Hebrew God as just one more God to be added to the pantheon of gods that they already had. And they expected the Jews or the Hebrews 
are the new Christians to do the same thing. Well, just accept all of our gods and add it to your list of gods. And of course, the Christians, to their credit, and the Jews and the Hebrews rejected that. And that was a point of contention of Hellenism. The Jewish and later Christian insistence on keeping their religion pure amused the, uh, and sometimes angered the Greeks. It was the cause of the Maccabean revolts, the destruction of, the Jeru of Jerusalem in AD 70, and the martyrdom of many Christians. Hellenism did not infiltrate the Christian belief of monotheism, but it did reject it. And Christians and Jews paid a heavy price for their faithfulness. So one of the things that Hellenism could not do, and I applaud Christianity and, and, and Hebrews and Judaism, was that Hellenism could not infiltrate monotheism, meaning that there is still but one God. And to the credit of those that were there, they rejected polytheism in the name of monotheism, or in essence, they, they rejected many gods for the sake of maintaining the identity of one God, one creator. And that I, I, I applaud them in that respect. One of the things that that as we get ready to, to, to wrap up today's broadcast, we've, talk, we've been talking about the influence of Hellenism on Christianity. One of the things that, that did begin to, to happen is Greek philosophy uh, and, and, and the philosophical approach uh, that the Greeks began to impose upon a lot of what ultimately became um, uh, modern day Christianity and uh, is, you know, is Greek philosophy um, and how that crept into the teachings and the theology of ultimately Christianity. So, so let me, let me for a sake, for, for just a few minutes and then I'll get to some of the comments and thank you all so much uh, for, for your comments, because I definitely want to get to them here in the next minute or so. One of the things that uh, we, you know, we have to begin to understand in the study called theology of God, a, 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 a the, a theological uh, engagement with religion. First of all, it comes from a Greek word, theos, means, uh, um, means God. And ology is derived from a word that implies the study of. And so when you look at theology, you're looking at literally the study of God. Okay. And I am a, am a huge advocate that... God truly cannot be studied. God has to be experienced. And each experience with God is as unique as the fingerprints on our fingertips. No two experiences are alike. And the problem comes in, at, in, in this is that when I begin to put my experience with God on paper and make it the standard, I deny you the right to have that experience and make that experience your standard. Therein lies the problem with theology, because theology will always enforce that what I'm teaching is the way, not a way, the way. OK, and the minute you deviate from the way is when you begin to be a heretic, an outcast to be excommunicated because you deviated from the way. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, you've just denied me the opportunity to establish the way in my life. And therein lies the quintessential irreconcilable problem with orthodoxy, with Christianity, with Catholicism, and with any other major religion that you may have and uh, experience in the, in, on this earth. And so what we're trying to do as a part, as an advocate in, on, from this broadcast 
is encourage you to begin to have that personal, intimate, completely uh, um, harmonious between you and God relationship. Then now allow God to take what he's doing in you and add it to what he is doing in me and to a third and fourth and fifth and sixth person and thus expanding all the way out to the, the broader collective of the body. Let me say this. When life is conceived, a microscopic sperm meets a microscopic egg. When that happens, a physiological uh, uh, um, reaction <clears throat> begins to, to, a biological reaction begins to take place. That egg splits in half, then to four, then to eight, 16, 32. It begins to divide and multiply and divide. And ultimately what begins to happen is that individ those individual little splits and divisions begins to form a body. That body begins to grow and mature and grow and grow. And ultimately a person is birthed. And then that person begins to grow and expand and happen. All the time ever evolving into more of the person that happened at that egg and sperm intersection. What I'm getting at is the very beginning of life does not begin with the body. It begins with the microscopic engagement of a sperm and an egg. And in the spiritual sense, it begins with the spiritual engagement of the spirit of God with a person. And then God does that with another person and another person and another person and a third, fourth, fifth, and right on down the line. And God now has enough, has a collective that can become and ultimately does become the body that represents the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom heirs. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, um, allow me just a few minutes. And I, I like to to just share uh, some of the thoughts and comments. And thank you also very much for um, sharing some of your, your thoughts. Uh, Johanna says the way a person finds the way which is a person is not the same. There are some similarities, but uh, uh, by glory and, and for relationship with each other, not apart from intimacy with the Godhead. Truth in it, uh, truth in its truth, true form needs no apologetics for its nature. Uh, for its nature dispels and replaces a lesser revelation. And, and I, uh, Johanna, I think I absolutely understand what you're saying. Truth in its true form needs no apology for its very nature dispels and replaces a lesser revelation. That is, and I've, and I've worded it like this, God's revelation or God's word is only valid until God speaks again. When a greater word arrives, the lesser word must give way to what God is saying. When a greater understanding, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dispel the word understanding and, 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 and settle in on the word revelation. When a greater revelation arrives, a lesser revelation bows down to it. That is the spiritual equivalent to the survival of the fittest. When God sends a greater revelation, the lesser revelation or the lesser word or the lesser knowledge bows down to it and gives way. And then God goes on. And then he sends another word and a third. And, and we continue to go from glory to glory to glory. So it, it, we must begin to recognize that we will never, ever have the final word. Ever then that means God is finite. 
and I've embraced the identity that God is infinite and his creation likewise has an infinite nature innate to the creation. Gary says this, Levin has a great uh, pollution uh, and any and all normal life and thought, okay? To any and all normal life and thought, Levin. Uh, uh, and, and using that word leaven to mean uh, ungodliness or sin or that which is, is not of God uh, will ultimately pollute. And even as our Lord said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot. Uh, in modern day vernacular, we, we like to say uh, one apple can spoil the whole bunch. Uh, one rotten apple can begin to infect the next apple and that apple the next and, and it begins to multiply. The next thing you know, the whole bunch of apples have been uh, rotten and spoiled by one bad apple. And so um, we have to begin to uh, uh, make certain that what we are uh, engaging. I am satisfied with what I am, am engaging. I, I often say it like this, beloved. I often, I truly often say it like this. I said, look, I don't have a mind. I don't have a problem changing my mind, but you're going to have to convince me that my mind needs to be changed. You can't just tell me that I need to stop believing or I need to believe what you believe. You have to convince me that what I am believing is inferior to what you're presenting. And when you do that, I will gladly abandon what I'm believing and embrace what you're delivering to me. I don't have a problem with doing that. Okay. Not whatsoever, but you're going to have to convince me or you're going to have to present a superior argument to what it is that I currently believe. And I believe that that is the pattern of growth. That is the pattern of growth. Pastor Milton Lewis says this. The essence of intimacy is the privacy and uniqueness between two individuals. The minute I add a third party, privacy and uniqueness goes away. I cannot have an intimate relationship uh, with God if I let you dictate the premise and the characteristics of our relationship. And, and, and without divulging more of what the conversation that I had with this young man, this young Catholic theologian yesterday, Pastor Lewis, that is, that is spot on with what uh, I was advocating to him. Uh, as well, is that the minute you begin to dictate to me what must happen in my relationship with God is the minute I uh, abandon my intimacy. As you said, and as you so aptly pointed out, intimacy is between me and that next person. Okay? You can't stick your business knows in the business of me and God getting it on the way we decide to get it on. But now where that comes from is this whole idea that there must be corporate agreement before there can be individual intimacy. I'm going to say that again. Write this down. Most people believe that there must be corporate agreement before I can have uh, individual intimacy. It doesn't work that way. That is not the kingdom. The kingdom is individual intimacy first. And that individual intimacy develops into a cor corporate agreement. God can handle his, his own business, beloved. God doesn't need me to tell him what to do with you. God knows how to do in you uh, what he wants to do and have that agree with what he's doing in me and so forth and so on. That's the challenge and that is the very quintessential reason why religion can never be the source of, of, of God's dealing with his people. Religion cannot be. Uh, Johanna has one more comment and she says, I saw that uh, the translation, the translated word they use could have uh, uh, been another very specific word that would leave no room for argument if they wanted to say virgin. And Johanna, I don't know if I'm gonna, if I'm interpreting uh, what you're, you're, you're 
comment is, but I think I do. And that is, if they wanted to say virgin, if they wanted to say, um, what's the word? The word that was the word that was originally used in uh, Hebrew was the word that meant young lady. The word that was translated later was the word virgin. So they went from saying a young lady, which is the original word now, to virgin, which is the English translated word. And those two words are uniquely not necessarily the same. A virgin is often a young lady. It doesn't have to be a young lady. It could be an old lady that has never had sex. But typically, when you say a young lady, you're not implying a virgin unless you specifically want to say virgin. But that's not the word that was originally used. The original word was young lady. The translated word took the liberty to say virgin. That is, that's why I want you to do your, your uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the upcoming broadcast on that. And we'll do, we'll do a specific uh, uh, broadcast on that particular subject. Um, lastly, uh, there is another Hebrew word, uh, Johanna says, and you can see it on the screen. There is another Hebrew word that can explicitly mean virgin if they wanted to. Absolutely. That is exactly the point that I was making. I understand your point, Johanna. That's exactly the point. If they wanted to use a word that meant virgin, that was a Hebrew word that meant that. The Hebrew word did not mean that. And thus, we now have an understanding as to where did the translation come from then? And I will leave that for us to ponder and to discuss on another day. Amen. Well, listen, thank you all so much. I went just a little bit long. Thank you all. Mary, God bless you. Thank you, sister, for, for joining in. I really appreciate you doing. Gary, Johanna, Pastor Milton, and Jerry Phillips, my classmate. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, Gary Allen. Thank you, Gary. You're, you're so faithful, brother. I really appreciate you. And Patricia and Cassandra and Catalina. Thank you. Apostle Leitner. Thank you for so much. Sean and Rachel. I feel like Rumper Room here calling all these names. <laughs> well, listen, thank you all so very much. It has been and as always a pleasure. Uh, and I hope that what we're sharing is something that is really bringing and shedding some light in your kingdom journey. Remember, I'm not here trying to make you walk uh, uh, my journey. I'm here trying to journey along with you and that we can feed off of one another. There is a level of corporate engagement that we need to have, but that corporate engagement should never dictate your personal intimacy. Okay. My car, that corporate engagement should never dictate your personal intimacy. Your personal intimacy should, uh, should lead to the greater corporate expression of the kingdom. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so very much. Like someone else made a final comment. Uh, <laughs> Gary said, good vibes. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, amen. Uh, 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 Johanna, expanding questions to bring to Father. Amen. And that's what it's all about. That's exactly what it's all about. Well, listen, beloved, thank you so very much. Join us again next time as we continue to share with you truths of the kingdom right here on Kingdom Voice Broadcast. And until next time, be well, be blessed. We'll see you again next week.